And thank you all for joining us today, this, e well, this evening actually. And just before we start the session, I just want to point out that we have a BSL interpreter. So thank you very much, Kate. And also we have uh, simultaneous translation. So if you need simultaneous translation, it's on the bottom of your, um, of your screen and there's the global bar that you need to, um, if you need to have the translation, you need to make sure it's set to English and then you will hear the translation. So welcome. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel of people with us today uh, to celebrate International Day of People with Disabilities. Um, and of course, we all know it's, a na it's an international uh, day. And um, this year's theme is not all disabilities are visual. And uh, I say we have uh, this panel. So I'm going to uh, just uh, very briefly tell you, I'm Anne Jones. I'm the um, Deputy Presiding Officer of Dipri Llawydd at the Senate of Cymru. I've been an assembly member for my hometown in North Wales in, in the Vale of Clwyd since 1999 and I myself have a disability and I've since been elected to the assembly and consequently getting into the role of the deputy presiding officer I've done what I think I can do to make sure that people with disabilities will stand for public life I think it's very important and so um, I hope that many of you if you have a disability are listening out there you'll give some consideration to whether you think you can come into public life. So I'm going to start and introduce the fantastic panel who are um, Ellen Williams, Melanie Dudridge, Selena Kaimauer and Abby Owens. And I'm going to ask them to just briefly tell us a little bit about themselves. So shall we start with, we'll start with Ellen because Ellen's from North Wales as well. So Ellen, would you like to just say a few things about yourself? Um, so I'm Ellen, I'm a disabled blogger, writer and advocate. Um, I've been sharing my experiences of being vision impaired and chronically ill on my blog for just over five and a half years now, um, in the hope of raising awareness and helping others in a similar situation. And I also work as a social media and communications officer for Disability Wales. Thank you. Selena, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey. Hi, my name is Selena um, and I am an advocate, a writer and also the founder of Aubergine Cafe. This is our sign, Aubergine Cafe. <laughs> and um, Aubergine Cafe is based in Cardiff, but we are um, a national arts organisation which is owned and run entirely by autistic people. Um, we 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 make a conscious effort to to um, hire freelancers who are autistic as well, and, um, neurodiverse, and we try to make working environments that are more accessible for people. But not just working environments, but places where people can socialise. Um, safely and freely and so on um, and we want to be the role models that we never got the chance to see ourselves. Thank you. Melanie, would you like to tell us a little bit? Sure, I'm Melanie Dudridge. I'm a disabled mum. I, I live in Cardiff, originally from Florida. Um, I have a daughter, my daughter is um, nine and she's currently going through assessments for potential spectrum disorder. Um, we've been in that process for a couple of years. As well, I have participated in a few um, support programs with the disability charity Scope. Um, a couple of those programs, the, the programs are called Navigate and um, Parents Connect. So I thought I could uh, have, maybe if anyone had questions about different types of support for people like myself. Um, yeah, and I'm just here to talk about lived experiences. Well, that's great. And we're glad you can join us. And then Thank so, you. Abby, uh, would yeah. you like to? Of course. Uh, so my name is Abby Owens and I am based in the Vale of Glamorgan. Is that just not letting, um, obviously, chronic fatigue sort of stop me from actually pursuing the goals and dreams that I have. So I'm already um, working to launch a new company in Wales next year. And I'm also studying to become a nutritionist, uh, which I'll qualify in August 2022. And I really want to use that to help other people in the positions that I've been in. 
Okay, well, thanks. We were moving on just to say that you've all mentioned disabilities and certainly I was just wondering what experiences um, um, and what, you know, what you think, um, you know, what your experience of living and working in, way in Wales is like and whether the pandemic has helped helped you with your particular um, disability or whether you feel that you've, you've been marginalised even further. I wonder, you know, what what are the view, what your views are on that? Perhaps should we ask um, should we ask Melanie first? To what do you, what she thinks, and then um, yeah, that's um, fine. Um, so for the most part, the what I face as a disabled person um, living in Wales has a lot to do with uh, accessibility, um, and also sort of a not a lot of people are familiar with hidden disabilities. And I think most of what I face is due to that situation. I would love for there to be more awareness um, that people like me, people who you don't actually see visibly struggling, actually are disabled. Um, there, there have been problems as far as like access to disabled parking, um, disabled toilets. You know, those are, those are my main concerns as far as, you know, getting about. Um, and then I guess the other things would be m just seeking help for my daughter. The, the process of getting a diagnosis for your child is extremely cumbersome. And um, the only assessment that my daughter has remaining in order to give her a diagnosis or not is a, an in-school assessment by a specialist autistic teacher. Mm -hmm. So obviously, although you know, we have been waiting a couple of years, and then when the pandemic came in, it obviously made that completely impossible. Um, so it's been a bit frustrating that, that, that that's being held up um, because she's probably quite low on the spectrum. If she does fall on the spectrum, we, so, we do need that diagnosis to bolster, you know, to bolster us yeah. and, and to, to help her get the, the support that she needs. Um, as far as the pandemic, I, I, it's, I guess in some ways I've felt more supported, which I'll explain. Um, it has sort of forced me to get out of my comfort zone to seek help. It was sort of, you know, you get these letters and you, you find out that you are on the shielding list. And it sort of made me think of myself a bit differently that I guess it made me feel more vulnerable, but also that I needed more, more support. I needed more people around me kind of, you know, recognizing the situation I'm in. And um, so, yeah, I think it changed me in that way and sort of forcing me to go out and finding help and also to think about myself more than I have been because I tend to focus on my child and her needs. Um, I think also the, you know, the pandemic has been difficult, made certain things worse in the sense that um, I have Crohn's disease. That's one of my conditions. And it wasn't clear at first if I actually was on the shielding list. I didn't get a letter until the second, the second run. So that made it really um, a bit confusing um, to not know, to not know where I stood. Okay. Okay. Abby, what do you, what do you think? What are your experiences? You say you haven't stopped, your disability hasn't stopped you from, you know, fulfilling what your ambitions yeah, I think the pandemic's been really interesting for me. Um, sort of the the when the lockdown first hit, sort of my company was the first industry to actually been um, everything cancelled within twenty four hours because I work within the entertainment and events industry, and so obviously that was hit straight away. So everything shut down, and I think there was a bit of naivety that okay, well, we'll you know, a few months we'll have the three month lockdown and we'll be absolutely fine. And and I just think it became really evident that actually my company. Was wasn't going to survive um you know it still isn't you know going to survive until you know we get the vaccine and you know we can have more group gatherings in the future and stuff so for me it was actually uh, my company's going to be shut down and so the anxiety that came with that exasperated all my symptoms um really badly actually uh, with the chronic fatigue and so for me, it sort of actually gave me a chance to stop and sort of process um, sort of the sickness and, like I said, source out other doctors to work through. And I think what was what's been really interesting is everyone's been complaining about the lockdown, but I don't know about other people in this talk. It's like 
lockdown has been like that for me like on and off the last <laughs> five years so whenever yeah. I'm saying oh my gosh three months at home da, 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 and I'm like I've lived in my bedroom like most of my you know half my 20s the five years I was living with my parents and not seeing anyone and so that's been really interesting actually just seeing other people's reaction I thought well this is no different to me because this is how I've sort of lived with chronic fatigue. And yeah. I think that's with a lot of people with, you know, you know, sicknesses. And so that's been really interesting. And I would say actually the positive is seeing that people are given the option to work from home because the amount of people I speak to who suffer from chronic fatigue and adrenal fatigue and all this kind of stuff, and they have to keep powering and going to the office and, you know, drinking all this caffeine and trying to survive. And I, I actually see it as a positive that maybe the work-life balance will finally come into place. And I really hope it continues because I think that's so important that we have to start thinking, okay, work is needed for financial, but also our health is just so much more important yeah. so that we actually enjoy life as well. So, you know, I think there's been really positives off the back of it. Um, so that's the way I've seen it and sort of my journey the past year. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry for the, the technical. It's uh, like I thought it was me again. And I, no, was no, all I thought it was you again. Then I realized that we were all frozen. So anyway, but we're back on track. So great. Ellen, Again, you know, you've you've got a, you know a, a list, but you're a you know a successful blogger. You're also um, the one of the mo um, most successful young women. Um, I'm just going to read it out here. Uh, as one of the most of the hundred most influential women in the world for 2020, uh, as announced by the BBC. So, um, how are you? Um, how have you coped? Uh, or how we, has the pandemic made any? any difference to you or not in a good way or a bad way um well a bit of both to be honest um like abby was saying it was um i've lived a lot of my life it feels like in lockdown anyway because of miami so it was strange that the world was suddenly in lockdown as well um and experiencing things that i had previously been living anyway um, so it was good in terms of the fact that things were opening up online, that things were becoming more accessible in terms of socialising and working and things like that. But um, of course, new technologies were introduced to in order to navigate this new experience, which was difficult at the beginning in terms of trying to come to terms with that in and navigating it as a screen reader user. Mm -hmm. um so it was there were pros and cons to it um but yeah i think the pandemic has definitely um afforded me more opportunities to do more things from home and i started a new job during the pandemic which was a strange experience but it became something really re rewarding and it was great to be able to start that in the same boat as everyone else because everyone was re working remotely um, so I definitely think it's been positive in that sense but from a vision impaired person's uh, perspective um, when the information about lockdown and Covid was beginning mm. to materialise it was um, difficult to navigate some of those because it wasn't all accessible through my screen reader because a lot of it was visual so there's definitely been some barriers in terms of accessibility as well Okay. Selena, how, how do you think, you know, what your experiences of uh, living and working in Wales and, and how has the pandemic um, has helped you or hindered you in, or hindered the people in people you're working with? Okay, so, uh, well, in terms of living and working in Wales from a health perspective, um, I'm, you know, really thankful that we have a uh, health service which is free at the point of use in this country and that our prescriptions are free because they would would cost a fortune but um i um i have had some difficulties and a lot of um a lot of people within the autistic community have had difficulties as well with accessing diagnosis as an adult um in in wales and uh, in some areas more so in Wales than others especially where you don't where there aren't as many uh, GPs for example or or psychiatrists who are um, 
who have this a special interest in autism and are able to diagnose but now we have the integrated autism service and other things uh, which are moving things along a little bit I think we've got a long way to go so diagnosis and so on was very difficult I went private in the end after having known I was autistic for 10 years before um before that uh, diagnosis and um and actually it was my experience of living as a person with uh, um not just um autism but uh, uh well fibromyalgia is what the doctor settled on but there are a lot of um, crossovers with like ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, post-viral kind of um, syndromes as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so it was my experience actually working in organisations quite often either third sector caring organisations or even um, uh, like social care services and so on where I found the least support as an autistic and disabled person um, from my or from my management and mm -hmm. um, so it was actually my my horrendous experiences um, as an autistic person at work which kind of pushed me to to start the organization that I have now um, as, <laughs> Sorry, having um, one minute. And how the pandemic has affected us. Well, Aubergine Cafe has seen a big change. We were able to take a step back and stop trying to run the rat race so quickly. And we could think about what we really wanted to do. And we were able to diversify our work so that we could work online and help reduce social isolation to um, a huge number of people in Wales, autistic adults who were already socially isolated before the pandemic hit. Like others have, have said, for a lot of a lot of us, it, this is this has been great because we're given permission to stay inside, <laughs> which suits the um, which suits a lot of us very well, but um, that's not everyone's story. And some of us do need to get out and about sort of, uh, safely. And and I think one of the big issues that a lot of people I've found uh, in the autistic community um, having is anxiety at going outside with the ever-changing rules. Um, the, I'm, I'm not saying that they shouldn't change. I'm just saying these are things that cause anxiety. Mm -hmm. Ever-changing rules. Other people not following the rules, like not staying two metres away from yeah. you wearing a mask, all sorts of things like that. And not knowing whether you're going to be treated kindly in a supermarket if you have a meltdown. Just two days ago, a friend of mine, his brother had a meltdown, an adult had a meltdown in a supermarket the manager um, the manager intervened in a way that caused this autistic person to lash out. Now the manager is, was threatening to press charges and it got very out of hand very quickly where mm -hmm. a little bit of empathy and understanding and listening would have gone a long way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we've got a long way to go in Wales. Yeah. We're heading in the right direction possibly but we need to keep this momentum going we can't relax now we've got to keep yeah. pushing so so the welsh government under mark draitford has and um, mark draitford as the first minister has been quite clear that he wants to try and see more people work from home he doesn't necessarily think everybody's got to trail into an office and yeah. i certainly um i think the the senate has proved that it can operate um technology abound but we we proved that we can still do some jobs um and so do you think and you've all mentioned um you know your own i mean i have a, a, a disability that is a visual disability but i think the theme of international day of disabilities is not all disabilities are visual i think you've all said that you fear that um that people won't take it you know won't take your particular uh, situations in so do you think that we should be looking to do more homework in? Uh, should, should the Welsh Government look to 
a way of, of, of helping people to, to continue to work at where it's possible for those to work at home and where it's possible for people who want to work at home. Uh, I take your point, Selena, that you say that not everybody wants to work from home and they need to get out to, to avoid the isolation. So I just wonder what people think. I mean, Ellen, what do you think about that? Do you think that we that the Welsh Government should continue to uh, to make home working av uh, available for those who want it? Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, before the pandemic, a lot of disabled people had been fighting for home working to be a reasonable mm -hmm. adjustment and a human right for years. And then when it was suddenly made available overnight um, during that first lockdown, it mm -hmm. showed that it was possible and that um, people could work effectively and successfully from, from home. So I definitely think that we need to learn from the things we've seen during the pandemic and take that forward and realize it realize that disabled people can work effectively from home and contribute in so many different ways without be being in the office so i think that should definitely be considered as a reasonable adjustment going forward okay melanie or do you, do you feel that, that that's a good way forward for for people that have got um, hidden disabilities. You're on mute, Melanie. You'll need to unmute yourself. Sorry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I was just saying absolutely, but for me, it would be more in general, you know, like having, um, I don't work, so it's more like accessibility to doctors and social social situations. And uh -huh. it's, um, it's definitely opened up my world, um, being able to do things digitally. I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Abby, have you found it easier to work from home? Yeah, I've worked from home since I was diagnosed, to be honest, since I was 25. Apart from a couple of years, I tried to work in an office and that did not work out for me because, again, it's sort of when I need a rest or a sleep, I can sort of put that into a break and, and still carry on work and, and still be effective. And I think it's also a bigger picture of not just people with disabilities. You know, I, as I said, I've spoke to a lot of people with chronic fatigue. And actually, if you give them the opportunity to work from home, if they want to, because I know some people do like going into the office but giving that opportunity it means actually people then have time to like shop and cook good food and time to go for walks and time to exercise so I think it goes back to like actually then you are helping people be healthier beings that knocks on to any chronic illnesses because my chronic Ill illness started from stress stress at work and I think again it would just you know just have a knock-on effect with you know the NHS and and actually you know hopefully with some of the illnesses we have like post-viral infections we talked about etc you know it actually would help the people who are on the border to not actually go into full-on chronic fatigue that a lot of us experience and nine years on now I'm still battling whereas if I took a step back nine years ago um, and knew that I probably wouldn't be in this position and I think actually I think it could be a really amazing thing that we can be more of a, a well-being country and take a leaf out of New Zealand's book I, yeah. that would be my dream yeah. for Wales. Okay I mean I did say we're going to have a, a time for a question and answer and, and um, members who are listening to us and people who are listening to us but we've had one submitted which I think is fitting in with this and it's it says from whoever it was it says that there are a number of people with an invisible chronic pain condition I think you're you know you've your testimony to that that you can still achieve things uh, how do we involve these people in the society without prejudice so I suppose does home working allow you to fulfill your potential without that prejudice I don't know Selena what, what would you think you said you, you felt that Wales is on the right track, but it's still got a lot to do. Is home working going to, do you think, going to offer some some comfort? I think I think having home working as an option, yes. I have, I've worked in a lot of organisations though, where policy and procedure is put in place to protect the organisation rather than the, um, individual for example a mental health policy and procedure if somebody's experiencing mental health difficulties it's a quite a blanket 
policy, which means that so long as the organization has done this, this and this, they don't get into trouble. Um, and that's the sort of policy that we see mm -hmm. used against us over and over again. So we may be able to ask for reasonable adjustments, but whether or not we're given them can quite often come down to policy. Um, and I've had a number of occasions where I've had unions involved um, where the union have just said, you're just not likely to win this case. Yes, they're discriminating. Yes, we can prove it, but it's just not worth it. Um, and that's what we're faced with all the time. So what I would really like to, to see is some, some kind of, some kind of government backed campaign where organizations can really understand how to personalize, how to, how to make a policy which is person, where, that you can personalize towards people with disabilities and chronic conditions. Because mm. um, I do fear that policy will be used against us. Yeah, do you feel then, and particularly as women as well, because women, we've we've always, I think, had to work 110% more to, to be, a, to, to get to an achievement. And, I, you know, I'm very proud that the Senate has um, a woman as the presiding officer, myself as the deputy, and the chief executive of the Senate, who is the, the, the person who runs all of the commission and, and how it all works, as a woman. So we seem to have managed to have got to the top of, of where we're going. Um, and what we have to make sure is that there are plenty of women to come behind us. But do you think that uh, certainly with uh, hidden disabilities that you've probably, um, I think Abby, you alluded to it, if you'd have given, you know, or took a step back, is it the, the fear that if you're in an organization, you don't, you, you might be overlooked if so, by working from home, as you said, you're able to have a break, you're able to fa factor that break in, whereas you wouldn't in a normal office working day. Do you think that that's been an issue where people have thought, oh, I won't keep asking for breaks in case they think I'm not up to the job? Um, do you think, is that an, an issue? Is that for me? Definitely. Oh, absolutely. When, when I, I worked, um, you know, I, like I said, I tried to work for a company for about a year and, and it was really challenging. And it was also in America and America, they want you to work 50 hours a week till they kill you. <laughs> and I mean, honestly, I, I got to the point where I was um, nearly, you know, the closest I've ever been to a nervous breakdown. And I had to move back from Los Angeles to come back and restart my company because I was like, actually, I can't cope with this. And they had no no thought process as to how to manage and and it is it's very hard because as you said you know I'm I'm a woman in business and I started nine years ago and that's hard enough at the best of times and so you know I, I definitely don't tell clients oh I'm in bed in my pajamas writing you an email or a call but you know that is the way I've had to run my business and it's just pushed me even further um, and I think it is just being it, it's 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 having companies, and I do think some companies are getting better, there's a long way to go, but actually trusting their employees that they will get the job done. Do you know what I mean? And not being treated yeah. like children. Yeah. Because I think flexibility means also then, oh, I really want to stay in this company and I trust you, you trust me, and then we get a better job done. I think when people are started to be, you know, like you have to do these hours, nine till five, it, it just creates such a barrier. And I think, you know, it has to be cut, you know, some changes there. And I just think the productivity and the loyalty where actually employees will stay with these companies a lot longer than actually nowadays people like to move on. Um, I think that would create a lot healthier work environments and a lot healthier business in Wales is having these business owners just think a little bit I hate to say outside the box so cliche but of how they treat their employees and, and build this trust environment. Ellen you said you'd started a, a, um, a new job uh, during the pandemic so um, do you feel that you've had a, a more of a level playing field because you've been able to work from home? Um. Yeah, I think so. Um, I started at the same time as two other new employees. So it was great that we were all in the same boat and we were all starting work from home. So yeah, like you say, we were on the same level playing field. Um, I work for a um, charity that supports disabled people. So 
I'm lucky in the sense that I've had the support I need and the adjustments I need have been put in place. Um, and so I consider myself lucky in that sense. But yeah, it was definitely good to experience the new working world with other people um, without feeling left out in a way and without feeling any prejudice. Oh, good. I'm looking at the time and I'm probably going to get a, a note from somebody saying move on. So um, what I want to try and do is, is move on a little bit and say, um, those are very much how um, today's Wales and how you're coping with the, the issues and how we're all coping with the issues um, with the pandemic and that. So, so looking now, um, I suppose, to the future, um, what do you, there's many things that I think I'll do. Selena, um, I'll come to you in a minute, and, but you mentioned it, that you think that Wales is on the right track, but we're not there yet. So what, what things do you think that you would like to see the Welsh Government do that you think would help people with disabilities, both those who have got um, visual disabilities, but in particular those of us, those of you who haven't, for whom you probably have a, a you know, a, a different, a different take on it you know people can see my disability um not that they take much notice of it sometimes but they see it so they'll either um be aware that I'm not able to walk as fast or I'm not able to get upstairs unless it's a handrail but yours are, are and I think I think it was Melanie that alluded to it when she goes to the to park in the in the car parking space and you get out and you probably look quite fit and somebody's going to say what are you doing parking in that that's for disabled people rather than going and explaining your whole story so what what are the, what what do you think the welsh government could do to make life easy for people with disabilities moving forward selena shall we start have you got any views yeah i would um i'd really like to see some kind of incentive for people to do better mm -hmm. um <laughs> i mean maybe people could do better by themselves but we don't always and so some incentive for organizations to 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 make themselves more accessible and i don't just mean stopping at ramps and you know and signage and you know that kind of thing it we need to have some We've just got so many great people, so many great yeah. disabled pioneers in this country. And I think you've got so many resources that you can tap into and please pay these people. And um, I, I just, I think Wales has just got small countries, smaller countries like this. We've got less of the like big establishment that we have to break through. Changes have come about more quickly. Yes, I know there were jokes about us being kind of like a little bit behind, but I reckon that when we actually do try and instill change in Wales, um, it it happens, you know, we, we can do this. What am I trying to say? I think that the, the autism dividend, which is a, a piece of research that I think the Welsh Government know about, um, mm -hmm. certainly Mark Drakeford knows about this, because um, he was at the same um, event that I was when it was uh, launched. And um, it, it, one of the key findings that they found, the evidence-based research said that when you make a, a, a business autism friendly, you make it people friendly because people communicate more clearly. They feel looked after by the organization, something someone else said earlier, and they're more likely to look after the organization in return. And I think we need to rebuild this idea of community in Wales where we look out for one another and that includes at work and that includes us kind of employers looking after their employees who look after their organizations we can go back to, I'm not a fan of saying the good old days because there are a lot of bad things that happened in yeah. so-called good old days that we don't want to address in this thing but we really should be looking at access and not just for disability because like until we're all until we're all free none of us are really free okay because yeah. you can't say disabled uh disability um um rights unless you're also talking about like 
um, um, LGBT rights and, and uh, black rights, because we are, you know, I'm a, I'm a queer, disabled black, black person. So you, you, you can't talk about my rights without talking yeah. about, do you know what I mean? So yeah. we need to really have a, you know, I know that the Arts Council for Wales and, that, and the Welsh government have this cultural contract uh, that we're looking at now. I'd really like to work, know how that is going to be enacted or how people are going to be called out if they don't um, abide by the cultural contract. But I do think that this is the right direction. Okay. We, we've had a question in which was, was pre-submitted um, about how do we tackle um, the intersectionality of the protected characteristics? Because as you know, you know, we do have the Equality Human Rights Act. We also have the DDA, the Disability um, Discrimination Act, um, which I think we, we're slowly unpicking here, <laughs> um, yeah. which is a good thing, I think, you know, because I think yeah. we should challenge it. So how, with those um, protected characteristics, do we think we can, we can sort of tackle that? Because I think the point you're making, Selena, was very good there. I don't know, Melanie, you were agreeing with um, Selena there. I don't know. Uh, how do you think we should tackle that, given that there's so many protected characteristics within law at the moment? And how do we, how do we make sure that we we treat them all the same way? Um, or how do we how do we actually tackle that intersectionality? Do you, do you have any ideas? Well, I think it's important to have people like myself and the other panelists. Um, actually holding you know public offices and and making and making these important decisions um you know an ideal world would be that we're all equal you know including and irregardless of all of these different things that that we're confronted with um obviously there needs to be a very close look at each uh each need and each situation um but overall it's um just we just all want to we all want to be the same we all want to be seen as the same yeah i think so i think so i mean, i worked i worked as a trade union i was a trade unionist within the fire brigade union and for a long time uh, we you know it, women women were seen as oh you know women firefighters and then we went on to oh obviously people with um people with hidden disabilities could, could be yes. a firefighter but perhaps somebody like myself couldn't be a firefighter. I worked in the in the emergency control room. But we we eventually adopted a policy that said all different but all equal. And I thought that was quite a you know, and that's something that I keep trying to think about when when we're looking at legislation. We're all different, but we're all equal. And I think it's things like that. So it's my outside life before being a politician uh, led me to believe that I could do that. I don't know. Um, We've had another, I'm just going to take another question in because I think you were talking about how, um, you know, how people will look at um, Selena. And is there a need when looking at reasonable adjustments to remove that ability of an organisation to cite financial costs as being a, a reason or barrier? So, so, for example, if you ask for some sort of um, assistance and they go, oh, it's only for you. And actually, that's going to cost us an awful lot of money. You should should organisations be allowed to do that? I mean, perhaps we should ask Ellen because she works for Disability Wales. I don't know. Should what would what be your your well, what's your personal view? But what do you think? Should people be allowed to get away with saying, "Oh, that's too costly to do. Uh, that's unreasonable." Um, personally, I don't think so, um, because at the end of the day, the contrib contribution that that disabled employee could make to the organisation could be so much more valuable than the cost of a piece mm. of equipment, for example. But I don't think a lot of organisations realise that things like access to work exist. So um, access to work can cover the cost of some um, reasonable adjustments and equipment and things like that to allow disabled people to work to their full potential with the right support in place. So I think there needs to be more awareness of things like that within the organisations and more disability awareness as well. Okay. Abby, what do you feel about other, other things that we should be looking at to, to, to tackle uh, this, um, you know, the problems we, we're facing? 
Yeah, I've well, two points coming off the back of what Ellen said. I, I think it's a really good point, but it, it's really hard coming from the other point of view as a business owner and and knowing how little money I have in the bank account as much yeah. as I do, you know, want to help. It's and I and so I think that's where actually um you need help from the government to support that because it's like, you know, there's a lot of small businesses just trying to survive and living on the bread line. And so it is tricky with all the, you know, additions that are needed. So I think this is where the government has to help. The, the small to medium sized businesses for a start. Um, and I also just think is about um, normalizing it. You know, like you said, we're all different, but we're all the same. And I think it's just normalizing and having conversations. And, and Selena mentioned before about having role models. I think, you know, role models are so important to actually encourage people to realize, okay, actually everyone is going through a journey, a health journey, whether you can see it, whether you can't, you know, there's, you can see it, the NHS stats of what people are going through and it's really interesting it's so for right now i i'm an agent for um amy dowden on strictly come dancing and um you know her and jj chalmers are in the quarterfinals right now and obviously you know jj you can see his disability and amy if you don't know amy she has crohn's disease really chronically bad crohn's mm -hmm. disease and so it's one you can see and one you can't see but you don't look at them and vote for them because they've got disabilities you vote for them because they're amazing dancers and you can see the journey he's been on on and yeah, the courage yeah. and strength and I think that's where it becomes really important from the media point of view of actually having those role models and, and, and sort of encouraging people like you know you can do more things and dream big and um, and we welcome that rather than suppressing that so I think that's a really important start to educate people. Okay I'm going to turn to some questions because we did promise there were some questions and we've had, we've had loads in but I'm sorry that we're not going to get through them all, but the one that I, I think we ought to look at, it says that given that many disabled women are also carers, what provision for unpaid female disabled carers or funding is being made available to facilitate their opportunities for participation in their community careers or have their voices heard in politics? I wonder whether, um, probably that's one directed at me but I wonder whether you have any views or whether you are aware that there is there is help for for people with a disability we've just put a fund in and the electoral commission have done some work on it to help those people for whom standing for an election would be problematic um and you incur more costs so it's about saying um it's about giving you that ability to to almost have a level playing field again to start. I was wondering what do you feel, how do you feel that people with disabilities could break through into becoming uh, representatives of their, within their communities? Who, Melanie, should we start? What, because you're, I think you're, you, you know, I think you'll identify as a carer, won't you? Because you're a nine year old and. Yeah, it's funny because I, I am a carer, but I also, um, my husband is my carer. Um, yeah. we're, we, have, we have sort of a unique, um, a unique situation in our household. Um, I, it's more the practical support that that is hard is hard to get really I mean to, to for example to free myself up to be able to to campaign or, or try to assist with legislature or make more differences than I want to it would it would be the practicality of time if that makes sense so you know it would just be a matter of my daughter having um, yeah just having the help that she needs to al allow me to to have more time yeah so so if, if there was a fund that could help you pay for some dedicated um care for for your daughter while you were out you know as i had to do in the past pound the streets and i don't pound him very quickly but i i have done it you know and it's one of those so you, it would so it would help you then it, certainly a financial incentive or some sort of assistance would help you would it if you were yeah, to stand yes and and I also think this is where awareness also filters in. Um, you know, I think there should be more visibility of people like myself yeah. shown as having disabilities. Do you know what I mean? Like in real life, this is me, this is yeah. what I look like. These are the situations you're gonna see me and you're gonna see me put, you know, with a blue badge. I think it's yeah. really important so that we're talking about that view and, and equality. And I think that is a big part of it is, is being able to understand that there's more than than what you can see. There's there's more involved. Yeah, yeah. Ellen, what do you feel? 
Um, yeah, I agree with that, to be honest. I think it comes down to awareness at the end of the day and putting that support in place for people so that they can go about their day-to-day -day lives in the most accessible and the most easy way for them. Um, in terms of the fact that hidden impairments, you know, there's a lot of prejudice around hidden impairments and things like that. But at the end of the day, that's what disability looks like for a lot of people. Um, I, I remember I wrote a blog post last year and someone, um, I asked people to contribute to it and one person said that they might not look disabled, but that is what disabled looks like. And I think it's important to remember that you can't see every impairment, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist. And it doesn't mean that person doesn't have symptoms. So I think it's about having an open mind and remembering that, you know, everyone's facing something that you know nothing about behind closed doors. Abby, what do you think? You need to. <laughs> that's, um, become, that's become the actual, I think that will become the phrase of 2020. You need to okay. unmute. unmute. Or, yeah, or the finger down, you need to unmute. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, it's fine. I just think it's echo everything that's Melanie and Ellen said. I, I, I think. I just I think what's been really interesting with the pandemic and I think everyone's learning that actually everyone has a story and everyone has a battle and you know whether it's mental physical yeah. emotional and I think that's really built well I, I hope it's built quite a lot of empathy with people realizing that actually you know loneliness and mental health and and the chronic illnesses and disabilities we're dealing with um, on a day-to-day -day basis and I think um I'm just hoping that continues and just actually realizing that people do have stories and journeys that we have to be more considerate about and more awareness with it all. And I think it, it's, it's it echoes everything we've said about awareness and, you know, role models and visually seeing that, that people can realize that and understand. Yeah. Selena, what do you think that, um, do you think that that particular fund would help? you know, the people that you're, you're with and your friends to, to, to come forward and stand for, you know, community yes. positions? And... Um, um, yes, I would think so. I mean, if I can, if I can just give you an example of the, 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 the sort of like extra sort of support that we need. I struggle with um, executive functioning, tra transitioning between tasks, starting tasks and so on. I've got what some might call a brilliant mind, but I just lack the the ability to just just um, sit down and get all my ideas out. Um, I for this event here, which is an hour long, um, yes, half an hour at the beginning for for technical stuff. So an hour and a half. If this was an in person event, and I have taken part in in person events at the Santa, so I've got real life examples, this would have involved two weeks of anxiety, except that I didn't actually find out two weeks ago, but still a regular <laughs> event, two weeks of anxiety, um, becoming more extreme, so a couple of days beforehand, an awful lot of preparation work, um, probably a couple of meltdowns on the day, uh, won't be able to do any of the work on the day the next two days I'll be recovering probably in bed. So that's like for a one and a half hour event, that's a, that's an awful lot of like time that I've had to put into it and a lot, a lot of energy. But certainly I'm not exaggerating when I mean like two days after I would have spent in bed because it's, it's everything from the sensory input to the dealing with timetables and I have a very poor concept of time and dates and so on so I'm constantly stressed about missing things um yeah. and so actually you know having something that will enable us to pay for somebody to take some of the uh, um like to drive us somewhere instead of us driving so we can spend that time like yeah. calming preparing ourselves um uh, having somebody who is able to help us to organize things so for me who has a difficulty with like times and dates and things this would be perfect because i'm i am known to be charismatic i think i would be quite great as a people's um uh, spokesperson but it's just it's not fathomable for me at the moment because it's too much work just to to get one thing done yeah 
and I've got my hands full. <laughs> you, you're doing it fantastic, and you're you know. So we've got roughly about six minutes left. So what I want to do is ask you one last thing, and to say to you, what are your hopes and the aspirations for the future? Bearing in mind we have Senate elections coming up in May. Hopefully, she says, um, pandemic, whatever. Um, so, and we're going to have 16 and 17 year olds voting for the first time here in Wales. So what are your hopes and aspirations for the future? For the future? They can either be a personal hope, a personal aspiration, or even a, a, um, an organizational one, or even a, a Wales wide one or a global one. What, what exactly? So let's see who, who I start, go? Oh, you start, Selena. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanna see lots of firsts for Wales. And I don't just mean first yeah. for Wales, but I mean Wales being the first to, to implement this social measure, this thing. I wanna see loads of firsts. I know we can do it and I know we've got the people here, the right people here to make it happen. Mm -hmm. We just need to do it. Thank you. <laughs> Melanie. I'd like to see more more support or more funding for uh, charities that 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 provide support to disabled people. You know, there's some great programs out there, which I touched on briefly in the beginning, the Navigate program for um, for parents that have a child that is either going through a diagnosis or has recently had a a, a, dis a disability diagnosed. And um, that's a super rare opportunity. You know, you don't find those situations where, you know, your child hasn't yet been diagnosed or, or you're just going through the process. Um, so yeah, I think that that charities that are doing this really good work like Scope, I think, you know, they need more consideration and support. Okay. Abby? Um, my word, I'm really passionate, as I said, I'm studying to be a nutritionist um, and graduating in a year and a half. So for me, we'll be building out like a nutrition business. And I've got the vision of sort of educating people on sort of, you know, how to eat well, how to live a healthy lifestyle so that they don't, you know, unfortunately deal with things that I've dealt with, like chronic fatigue, etc. And, and what I would love to see, and I love what Selena said about firsts. Um, I truly believe that, you know, again, as Wales is, is, is a great nation. And, and like you said, we don't have all the you know um establishment stuff that in England and I feel like actually just the realistic point of view that the NHS can't deal with all the chronic you know disabilities mm -hmm. that are going on and actually being very a lot more open to alternative therapies and making that affordable because for me when I was diagnosed all the doctor said was here's some antidepressants off you go and we've ruled out everything else and how can you live like that so the way I've actually been able to improve only you know small each year you know I small you know have the improvements is all through alternative measures and nutrition and I would love to see more education of that in schools and then that tackles obesity and you know all these kind of you know stuff that it can help with so that's sort of my vision personally and sort of a mission of just really encouraging that because I think alternative therapies are just still put to the back but actually they can really save the NHS and help a lot of people where the doctors can't help these chronic sickness sicknesses okay Ellen what do you what what do you have hope or aspiration for the future um, well, I can only echo what everyone else has said, really, but I think disabled people's rights need to be put on the agenda and conversations need to be happening with disabled people and disabled people's organisations. This is saying that nothing about us without us, and I think that really needs to be bolstered by action. Yeah, so I think it's only fair that I say to you what my hope is. My hope is that there that someday when I retire, and it's not just yet a while, hopefully, um, that I see Selena, Melanie, Ellen, Abby, all champion the bit at the Welsh Government, either as a Senate member or as, as somebody who will become that, that champion. Um, as I mentioned, um, while we were all waiting to, to start this, uh, I've just been elected as the um, regional champion for parliamentarians with disability for the commonwealth association which is uh, an, uh, one of the regional ones and that, the region is the british isles and the mediterranean region and you know i just want i met with a group the, with the other eight champions the other the other uh, week on a on a visual uh, virtual um meeting but and i realize 
yes, we have a long way to go. I think you're right, Selena, there's a long way to go. But you know, when I've stood back and watched, I've seen some real changes since the Senate has been, you expect me to say that because I'm a Senate member, but I've seen some real changes. I've seen where we've tried and we've taken the social model of disability and tried. We might not have got it right, but I think we've done our utmost to, to get there. And I just think we need people like you tonight um, to continue that work and work, you know, and, and make sure your voices are heard. I'd like to thank you, really. I've, I've enjoyed it. It's an hour that's gone, would you believe? And I'd like to thank you because I've really enjoyed it. I hope very much that um, you've enjoyed it too. And I hope that people who are listening to us will have enjoyed it. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. I might talk to um, the events team who have run this about whether we can find some answers for those questions that we didn't get round to talking to. But I just want to say, you've really, really cheered me up on what is a horrible day because it's been, it's rained in North Wales, as Ellen alluded to. But you've really cheered me up, you've given me some hope. I just feel that with people like you fighting the causes that you have done for International Day um, of People with Disabilities, you have really taken that theme of hidden disabilities and made it work. And hopefully we've given people something to think about. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Dioch, Dioch and Vauri Yao, thank you so much for joining me tonight. And thank you. And we want to say thank you to Kate as our um, BSL. So thank you very much. And you have to wave, don't you? And also to say thank you to the events team and the technical people behind the scene at the Senate who have set this all up and, and went away and found you. So thank you for your agreeing. Um, Abby, we I suppose, do we all have to vote now for JJ and... Um... Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so that's it. And, and so, so, yeah, I suppose that's... Is that the commercial at the end of at the end of the program? Perhaps, but no. But thank you all so much for joining me. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you have as well. And I hope that we will get together again and be able to review some progress. So, Jochen thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So, uh, thank you very much. And now, I think I think that's the end of the process. And I, you know, as I say, um, I can't thank you enough. So, Jochen thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank yeah, you. bye.